Desperate times call for desperate measures. This is especially true for many of us in healthcare, as we find ourselves adapting to new roles and new units, innovating to tackle a new disease while adjusting to a new surreal reality. Hence, in an effort to reestablish some degree of normalcy, we decided to resume the release of our episodes on the Neurocritical Care Society podcast. As I say, the show must go on, and at least now you can listen to something that is non-COVID related for the next 20 minutes. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hey, NCS podcast listeners, this is your host, Fawaz Mufti from Westchester Medical Center. With the rapid evolution of neurocritical care, better comprehension of the Q-brain injury, as well as the relatively rapid influx of new medications, today more than ever, neurointensivists find themselves engaging and partnering with critical care pharmacists. From sedatives, hyperosmolar agents, vasopressors, or more specifically, anti-epileptic agents, neurostimulants, or reversal agents, the pharmacotherapy of acute cerebral injury is undoubtedly complex and multifaceted. Hence, the NCS podcast decided to partner with the highly successful Pharmacotherapy of Neurocritical Care series, The Pawns, in a limited release to cover pertinent pharmacologic topics presented by experts in the field of neurocritical care. Over the course of the coming months, you will hear a number of selected Pawns talks, but please do let us know if there are particular topics you would like to be additionally covered. Without further ado, here is The Pawns. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neurocritical Care Society podcast. I am Mirnas Pajman, co-chair of the Pharmacotherapy of Neurocritical Care series, also known as PONS Subcommittee. It is a pleasure today to have Dr. Jessica Traeger, a neuroscience ICU pharmacy specialist at University Hospital's Cleveland Medical Center, join us to discuss her PONS presentation on substance withdrawal and neurocritical care. Jessica will describe commonly encountered withdrawal syndromes in critically ill patients, review pharmacologic treatment options for patients undergoing withdrawal, and assess potential challenges when managing neurocritical care patients with substance withdrawal. Due to variability in clinical evidence in this area, standard treatment regimens are mostly lacking. Jessica will discuss the evidence evaluating treatment strategies and special considerations for neurocritical care patients. Jessica, welcome today to the Neurocritical Care Society podcast. Thanks for having me. So can you talk about some of the specific challenges to treating substance withdrawal in neurocritical care patients? Yeah, so we definitely do encounter a lot of challenges when it comes to patients who are withdrawing, and it can absolutely complicate their care. So one of the biggest ones we run into is just even identifying patients who are going through withdrawal. So getting a good patient history can be really important. You know, specific symptoms and severity can they'll vary based on the substance, but, you know, general and nonspecific withdrawal symptoms like anxiety or nausea or autonomic dysfunction can easily be confused with a primary illness and then not treated appropriately. For our patients, getting a good history can be difficult if they have a sudden neurologic injury since they may not be in a state to communicate um, with providers at all. Also in neurocritical care, we place a really big emphasis, of course, on our patients' neurologic exams, and you know, we can be sensitive to changes to that. Um, and that can leave us in a precarious position because many withdrawal treatments, they involve sedating medications. So if we treat and then we cause over-sedation, that can interfere with the neural exam. But then on the other hand, if we're so concerned about the side effects and we undertreat the patient's withdrawal, that can then lead to worsening symptoms. And then there are some other challenges we run into when figuring out treatments for these patients because people with neurologic injuries are almost always excluded from trials or any of the published literature on withdrawal, which really leaves us in a position of having to extrapolate results. Great, thanks. So to get started, can you discuss a certain type of withdrawal situation that is very particular to neurocritical care? such as nicotine withdrawal in patients with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage? Sure, of course. So we know that smoking is a risk factor for subarachnoid hemorrhage, so nicotine withdrawal is something that we're going to frequently encounter. So the symptoms of nicotine withdrawal are physically mild but can cause a lot of patient discomfort. They can include anxiety, irritability, and slowed cognition. And then in even more severe cases, um, it can resemble delirium. So the onset of nicotine withdrawal can start within a couple of days and can last for a few weeks. And unfortunately, this time frame is similar to what we would see, you know, for vasospasms and delayed cerebral ischemia. So there is this concern that if you have a patient going through nicotine withdrawal, could those symptoms, if they come up, cloud the picture when evaluating for vasospasm? An obvious answer to that would be to then treat the withdrawal with nicotine replacement, and typically that's going to be administered as a transdermal nicotine patch, although gums and lozenges are also options. So in general, nicotine replacement is considered to be fairly benign. 
However, we do know that nicotine can cause blood vessel constriction. So, of course, vasoconstriction is an extremely concerning word to be used when we're talking about patients with our subarachnoid hemorrhage. So this should really give anyone pause before going to administer nicotine to these patients. Is it safe, then, to use nicotine replacement therapy in these patients who are at risk for cerebral vasospasm? So to get to the point, the answer is that it does appear to be safe to give these patients nicotine replacement. We have two pretty large retrospective studies that compare outcomes you know, in patients who had subarachnoid hemorrhage, comparing smokers who had received nicotine replacement to smokers who had not received nicotine replacement. And then one of these studies also included a comparator group with non-smokers as like an extra sort of control. And in both of these studies, there was no increased risk of cerebral vasospasms observed and no difference in outcomes. Taken together, this kind of implies that if you feel it is clinically necessary to treat a patient's nicotine withdrawal, there probably is no increased risk of vasospasm associated with that. Let's change gears and talk about a different type of withdrawal syndrome that is specific to ICU patients and that as healthcare practitioners we are somewhat responsible for, and that's iatrogenic opioid withdrawal. What is this and how can we identify at-risk patients? Yeah, so iatrogenic opioid withdrawal is essentially something that occurs in ICU patients, typically in those who are mechanically ventilated who receive a lot of opiates during the course of their care. So the classic example would be a patient who is mechanically ventilated and then receives continuous infusion of fentanyl for sedation, which can go on for days or even weeks. And then, you know, it comes time to extubate the patient, so we turn off the drip, and then they go into opiate withdrawal which can be extremely uncomfortable for patients and, if not properly identified, can lead to other inappropriate treatments. So, for example, if the patient becomes tachycardic, they get a fever, we might start to think about infection when that's not actually the case. So, unfortunately, iatrogenic opiate withdrawal is a difficult syndrome to recognize. We don't have um, a good way to identify adult patients who have this, and we also don't have a good idea of what the risk factors are aside from just kind of generally saying patients who are receiving opiates for a prolonged period and who are receiving larger cumulative doses. So it's very nonspecific. This is probably a situation where prevention is really important. So if appropriate, targeting lighter sedations and utilizing daily sedation interruptions to minimize overall exposure Again, if appropriate, which is not always going to be the case. Thank you. So what is the best way to treat these patients to lessen their withdrawal? So that's a really good question, and unfortunately, it's not one with a really good answer, especially since it's so difficult to identify these patients at risk. So, you know, one option could be if you have some concern, if a patient might go through withdrawal, uh, would be just to be aware that this is something that can occur and then stop the opioids and monitor for signs of withdrawal. If the patient still has a secured airway and is on a continuous infusion, you could try to wean down the infusion and monitor. The downside to this is that, you know, if it ends up taking a while or if you're going slow, you might end up leaving the patient on a drip longer than they would necessarily need, and they might stay mechanically ventilated for longer um, than would otherwise be indicated. The other option would be to try to transition a patient to oral opiates and then wean down. There are actually a couple of papers that evaluated oral methadone, which is a long-acting opiate for this, but these studies were small and only saw modest changes, which unfortunately leaves us with little actual guidance aside from just having good communication, um, good monitoring, and just treating symptomatically. So, Jessica, I'd like to spend the rest of the podcast discussing what is probably the most common type of withdrawal we encounter, and that is alcohol withdrawal. Can you give a little bit of background on alcohol withdrawal and treatment strategies? As you mentioned, alcohol withdrawal is unfortunately very common. But just to give a little bit of some background on what causes it, it results when there's an imbalance where you end up with too little GABA signaling in the CNS, um, which is inhibitory, and too much glutamate, which is excitatory. And this can result in some of the classic symptoms we see with alcohol withdrawal, like hallucinations, seizures, autonomic instability, or delirium tremens, or DT. So because of this, the backbone of treatment for alcohol withdrawal is to administer GABAergic medications. And the primary agent is going to be benzodiazepines, uh, which have a long history for treating alcohol withdrawal, and I probably could have spent this whole podcast just talking about that, but I'll just give some of the highlights. So the two most commonly used benzodiazepines for withdrawal um, that we use in inpatients are lorazepam and diazepam. For outpatients, there's actually quite a bit of literature um, with an oral agent called chlordiazepoxide. 
However, there are no studies that directly compare these agents, so there's no proof that one is better than the other. So when it comes to picking the agent of choice, you want to take into account specific patient characteristics, like the duration of action, and also agent availability. So, for example, in the past couple of years, we've had some shortages of the IV diazepam, which has really limited its use. And another thing to be aware of is that benzodiazepines can cause respiratory depression, which is their main side effect. Another agent I did want to mention is phenobarbital. It's a barbiturate, so it also has a GABAergic mechanism, and it also has a long duration of action, which is a good thing for alcohol withdrawal. It allows for some autotitration of effect. It's an older drug, but lately there's been some renewed interest in using it for this indication with some positive results. But as far as how to best administer your benzodiazepines or your barbiturates, you know, just in order to optimize your treatment and decrease the risk of complications, there's a lot of strategies to choose from. And really what's been shown to improve those outcomes is just to have an institutional protocol, which can guide practitioners. And fortunately, most hospitals and ICUs already have this. Most protocols will use um, what's called a symptom-triggered approach where patients are evaluated based on a validated scale, which then is going to direct as-needed treatments. So another agent, though, that has gained popularity more recently for their treatment of alcohol withdrawal is dexmedetomidine. Is the evidence for this promising? Yeah, so a couple of points with uh, dexmedetomidine to start. Um, it's a centrally acting alpha-2 agonist that we typically use for sedation. The important thing about the mechanism is that it lacks any of that GABA activity. So it's not going to treat the underlying pathology of alcohol withdrawal. So the role is really as an adjunctive agent that can help calm a patient without causing any further respiratory depression and um, potentially can help with some of those autonomic symptoms. But importantly, it's not a replacement for benzodiazepines or whatever GABA agent you use. So there are a lot of case studies and case series evaluating dexmedetomidine and for withdrawal. More recently, we've seen some smaller prospective randomized trials that have been published the results have shown that treatment with dexmedetomidine can decrease benzodiazepine requirements, but this hasn't consistently translated to improved clinical outcomes, such as decreased ICU length of stay. And this agent does have side effects. So most commonly would be bradycardia, and unsurprisingly, we did see increased rates in these trials. So the bottom line is that the role for dexmedetomidine and alcohol withdrawal is really not as clear as we would, we would like at this point. It's an agent that's been available for a long time. So it can be utilized as an adjunctive agent, but we do need to be mindful in how we're employing it and what our clinical endpoints are. Are there any new directions for treatment of alcohol withdrawal? So there is one therapy I wanted to mention, and that is ketamine. I think right now in general in critical care, ketamine is having its moment. And in the past couple of years, there's been a couple of new papers that came out looking at ketamine for alcohol withdrawal in this patient population. So taking a step back, ketamine works a little bit differently than the other agents we've discussed. It's an NMDA receptor antagonist. So as I mentioned before, you end up have, with alcohol withdrawal, you end up having overactivity of excitatory glutamate, which works at NMDA receptors. So mechanistically, it makes sense that ketamine could have a role in treating the symptoms. So like I just mentioned, in the past couple of years, we have seen some retrospective papers published that describe using ketamine in addition to benzodiazepines in ICU patients undergoing withdrawal. And the initial results look promising. Ketamine was associated with lower benzodiazepine requirements and decreased ICU length of stay. Um, however, to be cautious, and, you know, these were smaller studies. And there was less than 100 patients between the two of them, and they were single center and retrospective and did use very different dosing strategies, which really limits the applicability to practice at this point. However, I expect we'll be hearing more about this treatment in the future, so it's, I think it's something to stay tuned to. Well, thank you, Jessica, for your expertise today. And again, we really appreciate all of your insight regarding substance withdrawal in neurocritical care patients. Thanks again for having me. Please check out our other podcasts offered by the Neurocritical Care Society. Also, a full educational presentation on this topic and other drug-related topics can be found on the Neurocritical Care website under the PONS section. PONS is your neurocritical care pharmacotherapy information resource taught by the experts in the field. All PONS programs are eligible for CMA for purchase and free to society members for educational purposes. Thanks again for listening. The NCS podcast series is produced by the Neurocritical Care Society, whose mission is to promote quality patient care, professional collaboration, research, training, and advocacy in neurocritical care. 
Our production staff includes Bawazal Mufti, Romani Balu, Mike Brogan, Josh Levine, Benjamin Miller, Storane Shepard, Jim Siegler, Sarah Sternezer, and Chris Zamet. Our senior producer is Bonnie Rousseau. Our administrative staff includes Bonnie Rousseau and Angel Gindel. Music is created by Mohan Katapali from the Division of Neurocritical Care at the University of Miami. The NCS podcast series is available on NCS On Demand and wherever you may listen to your podcast. For more information, please follow us on Twitter at Neurocritical or on Facebook. I'm Fawaz al and thanks for listening.